You have to be living under a rock not to have noticed the prevalence of vampires right now in the popular culture. Go back just a few years, you've got the very popular TV series, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, you also have Anne Rice's uh, Vampire Chronicles are still very popular. HBO has a series called uh, True Blood. And probably most prominently, you have this series of books called Twilight, now being made into very popular movies, all about uh, teen vampires and teen mortals uh, falling in love. Well, what is it with this fascination with the undead? Certainly, clever marketing has a lot to do with it, but I think there are deeper uh, forces at work, too. There's a principle in the spiritual order that corresponds to the law of the conservation of energy. And I would articulate it like this. The supernatural, when repressed, doesn't go away. Rather, it comes up in indirect and often distorted form. We are, by nature, wired for God. But we live in the midst of an increasingly secularized culture. Think of the last, oh, 50 years or so, when a lot of the biblical worldview has been attenuated, or in some cases, uh, denied altogether. But see, you can't finally repress these very deep aspirations toward the supernatural that are in us. They will come out in some kind of distorted form. And I think the vampire phenomenon is a very good example of this uh, principle. What do you see in the vampires beside, you know, blood sucking? What's their main quality? I would say it's immortality. They are the eternally young, the undead, those that never die. Well, see, the secular ideology would say that we're just, you know, clever animals, and when we die, we simply fade away. But deep in our spiritual hardwiring is this conviction that we don't just fade away, that we are destined for an eternal life with God. When the ideology is saying, no, that's just all childish fantasy, it'll come up now in this distorted form of, of the vampires. And I say distorted because the quest for eternal life is not a quest for everlasting life in this world. Eternal life means being brought up into a higher dimension. But see, when that's been denied, we'll settle even for the very thin gruel of the vampire stories. Now, just recently, I came across a very interesting interview with uh, Anne Rice, the author of the Vampire Chronicles. In many ways, the, the godmother of this whole contemporary uh, vampire chic. She talked about her own coming of age back in the 60s and 70s of the last century, when very many of her colleagues fell into a sort of secularist uh, morass, precisely when the supernatural view of life was being uh, repressed. And she says that her character, Louis, the vampire who was famously interviewed in the first of her novels, was a symbol of a lot of the people of that time, her colleagues, who were in a spiritually deadly situation and could find no way out. So think of that, that lost vampire who's in this terrible situation but just doesn't know the path forward. That was the situation of many of Anne Rice's own contemporaries. What makes it all, of course, even more fascinating is that Anne Rice herself found a path through that morass to authentic supernaturalism. Anne Rice uh, re-embraced the vividly imagined Catholicism of her youth, and now she's dedicated herself to the Lord. She's writing books about Jesus. She's inaugurating a new series of novels on angels. And despite all the protests of her, uh, of her many fans, She's not going to write any more books about vampires. She found her way through this kind of ersatz spirituality. She who was the godmother of it. She's at the source of much of this. She found her way through that ersatz spirituality to the real thing. And of course, that brings to mind, too, this, this equally fascinating figure of Bram Stoker, the author of, of Dracula, the greatest uh, vampire story of all time. Bram Stoker is a 19th century uh, Irishman whose story is filled with spiritual themes. Dracula is a vampire because he cursed God. That's why he has that great aversion to the crucifix. So his situation is put right away in a spiritual context. And the story unfolds, really, as a story of his redemption. Von Helsing, who is both a, a scientist and a devout believer, the two <laughs> were together in those days, and they still can be, but Von Helsing basically leads Dracula toward his own redemption.
and Catholic themes of eternal life, of Eucharist, of baptism, of the sacraments, redound in that story. In the 19th century, obviously, it was still possible to situate the vampire legend within the far greater meta-narrative of Christianity. What we witness today, I think, sadly, is the declension whereby a robust, vividly imagined Christianity has now devolved into a kind of this bloodless substitute, which are the vampire stories. Thank you.